So I know I'm a little bit late getting to it, but better late than never, I suppose. The past week in professional wrestling, yeah, one day in particular, I was really, really full of bad news with the passings of Brickhouse Brown, Brian Christopher, and of course, Nikolai Volkov. Like it was literally bing, bang, boom, one after the other. Crazy how that works out. I'm just going to take a few minutes and talk about each of these guys and kind of how they should be remembered or how I will remember them. Now, I will I will admit that I never really fouled Brickhouse Brown that much. Familiar with him, we became more familiar with him later in life, especially when he did some of his great shoot interviews or talk about Pat Patterson and all of these other things. Um, so he did some good shoot interviews, but he was a guy that made at least a little bit of a name for himself in the territorial days of the 80s um, at a time where the business wasn't all that particularly friendly or kind to some of the black talent. Some places were, some places weren't, but he made a little bit of a name for himself and people do still remember him. What I think is more sad and tragic about this whole thing are the reports that he passed away from prostate cancer where he was diagnosed only in stage two but because he didn't have health insurance, all he was given was pain medication, basically, and allowed to slowly wither and die. Now, whether that, that is entirely 100% true, maybe, maybe not. Would I doubt it based off of this country? Absolutely not. And if anything, it shouldn't just be an indictment on professional wrestling and how they chew up talent and spit them out and they don't care for them after the fact. It should just be more of an indictment upon us as a society as a whole. Regardless of political affiliations or ideological beliefs, if we can't agree to somebody getting diagnosed early on in stage two and being denied medication because they don't have insurance and treatment that could potentially have extended their lives, saved their lives, is fundamentally morally wrong. And no alleged civilized society should ever, ever allow that to happen. But yet we do, because we worry about socialism versus free markets. And it just speaks to just how ridiculously idiotic we are as a society, a culture, and as a race, a human race. We are really dumb. Really, really dumb. And if that's what actually happened, then shame on us as a people for allowing things like that to happen. And we know they do, and they do all the time. And it shouldn't have to. Like it should be one of those things that just shouldn't be a concern. There are other things we should be able to debate and discuss, and that's fine. But something like that, like why would we even need to debate that? It's just a shame, I think, for a guy like Brickhouse Brown, because he probably could have been a little bit of a bigger star if given more shine and more exposure and more opportunities, or if he had to come along a little bit later in the business, maybe nation of domination time. Um, but rest in peace to him. Sounds like a horrible way to go. And then we get to Brian Christopher, Grandmaster Sexton. You know, this is a guy that we've known for years, has had his different troubles and different battles. And you imagine being the son of a wrestling legend like Jerry the King Lawler and ultimately trying to follow in your father's footsteps. There's going to be a lot of pressure, a lot of expectations. You had a dad that wasn't always there. So you're trying to get into wrestling to be closer to your dad at the same point in time, get out of your dad's shadow while still staying in your dad's shadow. It can be an incredibly tough thing to deal with. And there are a lot of people that benefit significantly from who their parents, their grandparents were, and they inherit money. You, know, you look at our president, you look at so many other presidents over the years too, not just the current one. Look at so many other people in positions of power throughout businesses all throughout the country. You know, a lot of that is inherited wealth. A lot of that is inherited and passed down to them, nepotism runs them up. It's just the way it is. So while certainly Brian Christopher got lots of opportunities in part because of his dad and who his dad was and who his dad has been and what he was involved with, and that certainly helped from a political standpoint behind the scenes, there's still the pressure of expectation and having to live up to that. And I will say, while he never measured up to being the king. He most certainly was a worthy prince in his own right. You know, I always remember Too Cool. 
to me, I think about that team, that group, with Rikishi, Scotty Tuhari, Grandmaster Sexe, as the epitome of the good of the Attitude Era. You take guys that are kind of floundering, you take guys that are kind of just wallowing in the muck, you give them something, you make it mean something, you let them take it, you let them run with it, you let them make it, and they can become stars. And I know that Too Cool were stars. They weren't megastars. They weren't superstars. But I promise you during that time, whether it was Scotty Too Hotty hitting the worm, or it was Rikishi and them about to dance off, or his Grandmaster Sex A taking off off the top rope, the people loved them. They were a hell of an act. They were a hilarious act. They were a great act. And they, to me, are one of those true personifications of the fun that we were able to experience as wrestling fans if we were so fortunate to have been around them during the Monday Night Wars, during the Attitude Era. Everybody felt different. Everybody was unique. Everybody had something. Everybody had a reason. Everybody had a purpose. And you look at this whole thing, like, oh, you're Scotty Too Hotty, and you're Grandmaster Sexy. This is something that in today's world of millennials we'll be talking about. It's all types of metro and borderline suspect. But 20 years ago, Scotty Too Hotty doing the worm was like a manly thing to do. A dude calling himself Grandmaster Sexy was a cool thing to do. Guys didn't shy away from that. They didn't back away from that. They embraced it like Balvinas being basically a wrestling porn star. These dudes were cool as crap. And we enjoyed watching them. And we're comfortable enough in our masculinity to admit it. But when you think about Brian Christopher, and I know he had a lot of demons, and it sounds like he met a very sad and tragic end with supposedly hanging himself in a jail cell at only 46 years of age. So sad and so tragic. You know, I, I say this, is that you, know, you can talk about it's wrestling, chewing up somebody and spitting somebody out. But he got a lot out of wrestling, too. And he did something that's incredibly difficult. He fouled in his, own, his dad's footsteps and managed to find a way to make a name for himself. Now, granted, not as big of a name, not as impactful of a name, not as meaningful of a name in the grand scheme of things, but still one that mattered. He was given opportunities because of his dad, yes. But ultimately, he had to do something with them, with the burden of pressure and expectations that comes along with that. And he did just that. And that, to me, is admirable. That, to me, is respectable. And that's why I always respected a guy like Brian Christopher. Because there were so many things pointing at him that he could have been an Eric Watts type or a David San Martino. But he wasn't. He ended up becoming Grandmaster Sexy. He became an act that people actually wanted to see. He became a star in his own right. He made a name for himself, even if it was for a relatively short window of time. Think about how many other people grinded away in wrestling for 10, 15, 20, 30 years and never made nearly the impact of Grandmaster Sexy. Just think about that. It's just, I hope now he's able to find peace in his soul. I really, really do. Because he deserves it. Battled a lot of demons. Did the best he could to overcome them. But unfortunately, there probably wasn't anything that anybody could have done to help him. At some point in time, everybody is responsible for their own decisions and their own actions and have to deal with the consequences appropriately. But it's a shame. Gone way too soon. And then we get, of course, to Nikolai Volkov. The biggest name of the three. You look at Volkov and you're talking about a guy that came from the uh, communist-dominated uh, eastern bloc of Russia, uh, lived under the Stalinist regime and their influences on the Soviet-dominated eastern bloc of Europe. He comes here to America, gets into wrestling, and becomes a star. Now granted, by the time I started seeing him in the mid and late 80s, his body had kind of broken down on him a little bit, was beaten up a little bit. You know, he was a better athlete in the 70s, in better shape in the 70s. But when I think about Nikolai Volkov, especially him in the Iron Sheik with Classy Freddy Bat Blassie, you're talking about one of the true great heel acts of that time. And when I talk about 
the epitome of less sometimes is more. And it's not how much you do, but it's what you do, when you do it, how you do it. Nikolai Volkov is a perfect example of that. When I think about old school wrestling, I think about kind of the naiveness and the innocence of it in a certain way. And the more clear cut, good versus evil. While the world has changed and it's a lot harder to pull off that dynamic, it doesn't mean that I can't go back and appreciate the way things were. And I absolutely do. And when I go back and I watch 80s wrestling, and every once in a while, maybe two or three times a year, I'll get bored for a little bit. And I'll be like, you know what, I want to, I want to hear some old school great heel reactions. I want to see people booing and cussing and yelling at the wrestlers, trying to fight the wrestlers, trying to start riots, throwing shit you know, basically causing all types of hell. I want to see that type of heat. And I can tell you, man, Nikolai Volkov, when he would sit there and he would start singing the Soviet national anthem and his hand would go up here and he would start singing the people like Madison Square Garden, it didn't matter. They just erupted. You want to talk about disrespecting an anthem. Wait for Nikolai Volkov to sing the Soviet national anthem in the 80s in the height of the Cold War and all of this, looking at the times and everything else, especially aligned with somebody like the Iron Chief from Iran, and oh my God, the match didn't even matter at that point. Everybody got to hate, everybody got to boo. And the ironic thing is, is I almost wonder if that specific type of gimmick, where we hear a lot about uh, nationalistic stuff doesn't necessarily work in wrestling or you know America versus the world when you look at the tenor and tone of the national anthem debate in the NFL and talks about rush and collusion and all this other crap the bottom line is is a character like Nikolai Volkov could absolutely work in today's wrestling and probably get damn near as much heat look at the heat that's generated for the NFL with the anthem protest on both sides People being mad because players are protesting. People being mad because guys like Colin Kaepernick can't get a gig. Everybody's pissed. And even if you say, well, the audience is down a little bit, they're still reigning supreme in the ratings. You're still making a shit ton of money. Now you incorporate that into professional wrestling and you took a guy who was a Vladimir Putin mark who sat there and talked about how we should be great friends with Russia and wouldn't it be great if we had Vladdy over for dinner every week and all of this and he sang the Russian national anthem and then took a knee during the American national anthem. Man, you want to talk about the heat that would generate just incredible. But when I think of Nikolai Volkov, I think about a guy who detested the Soviet Union, who detested communism and so many things that it represented. And he eventually came to embrace a role that helped him to expose the evils of the very life that he had experienced as a child. That takes guts, that takes courage. And in that time, where you still had plenty of people that believed it was real, or at the very least knew that it was fake, but didn't care because this guy was being anti-American. You know, a guy like Nikolai Volkov had to be careful. People were going to take chances. At, they were going to take shots at him in, in public. They were going to come after him. So you imagine the type of guarded lifestyle and the way he had to totally and completely give himself at that time to professional wrestling and truly live that life. It is something I will always admire and respect about that man. It's not always about the moves and the flips and the kicks. It's not always about the promos that you cut. It's not always about the chisel physique. It's about taking something, grabbing it by the balls, yanking it down, and making it your bitch. And when it comes to the 1980s and when it comes to the ability to generate real, meaningful, passionate heel heat, there were few better than Nikolai Volkov. So it's sad that all three of these men, you know, even Nikolai, that passed away about 70, 71, relatively young, but he still had a pretty full and complete life. A lot of people wrestling now wish they could have lived a life like him. Just sad when all these things happen, bing, bang, boom. And hopefully all of these guys, with whatever happens now, are able to find peace and be proud of what they accomplished in professional wrestling.